Welcome to Fixing the Friends. Today, we are going to compare three different chemicals and you're gonna see how well they do at stripping paint off of a car. And hopefully you'll be able to draw some useful information from this for and apply it to other situations regardless of whether or not it's on a vehicle. At the end of the video, I'll go over how well each did, what the advantages and disadvantages of each are. Uh, and then if you wanted to see more of the actual application process, uh, how that went in reality, as opposed to sort of a test environment. Test, it's not particularly scientific, but um, that will be in the next episode of the $300 painting adventure. I believe that will be chapter eight. And if not, I'm going to redub that with me saying a different number. That being said, let's just jump right into uh, the comparison. All right, so today we have a little bit of a test or an experiment. And I'd be trying three different brands or three different ways to strip the paint. We'll try the acetone again, which didn't really work last time, but I'm going to try covering it like it suggests on this one uh, with saran wrap or glad. And that's just to help it stay on and not evaporate immediately. Um, so I'm going to prep the surfaces by sanding them first and then we're also going to do a test with no sanding to see if I can maybe save some time by not sanding anything until I go to put the paint on. The two actual strippers are this one, Easy Strip, and whatever D Super is. But as you notice here, one is more deadly than the other. Uh, this one's supposed to be eco-friendly and vapor-free, or not vapor-free, but anyway, it's supposed to be half-decent. So ideally, if that one works okay, I'll be using that one instead, so slightly less deadly. But the biggest problem I find with when, whenever you buy chemicals at the store, it's not really consumer-friendly. When you look at these, it doesn't say anything about what the proper PPE is. You have to actually look up on the MSDS sheets. The average consumer will just look on it and on the shelf, and unless it says something specifically, they're not going to think, oh, I should wear a respirator or goggles or gloves. They'll just be like, well, it's there. Um, it doesn't say anything. I should be fine. Or they'll actually look and here, it says, do not swallow, may cause blindness if swallowed, uh, blah, 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 do not breathe fumes. And so many people, unless you've worked with chemicals before, they'll just assume, do not breathe fumes, okay, so I'm not going to huff the fumes, I should be fine. But no, it, it literally means, like, if you smell them, don't breathe them in. So, and same with this one, is it implies it's all good and fine. But again, it suggests breathing protection on the MSDS sheet. And the chemicals that are in there all individually suggest that, so it's probably a good idea to do. But it's not really difficult to put on a couple icons that say which PPE you should be wearing and perhaps uh, the degree of protection they need. Because the different respirators and things have different ratings. But yeah, it's an easy thing to do to probably save a lot of extra cost to the taxpayers for hospital bills, if you care about that, or just, you know, people's health. Now the goggles are there, one for splash protection, and two uh, for vapor, because you can absorb vapors and stuff through your eyes, and that's not good. Um, yeah, it can get into your bloodstream by breathing, eyes, wounds, or through your skin, depending on the chemical. Not that you care. So, I have gloves. I'm going to use two layers, because these probably aren't sufficient. But they were cheap. Alright, let's get started. I know it looked ridiculous, but they were cheap goggles. Start with the acetone, because 
I have doubts. And we'll put it right here. Faster. It may melt the plastic, we'll see. This one doesn't really say how much to put on, but we'll do this one up Let's put some more on. That doesn't seem enough. And now, for the deadly one. It's quite the gel. back on. So you should use an actual paintbrush with this one. I only had these foam ones and as you can see it's already kind of dissolving it. but at least it's working. Take a look. Okay, well, the shortest one is supposed to take 15 minutes. So, I'll check back after then. Apparently, I spilled some. All right. So it's been 15 minutes. As you can see, the deadly one has worked quite well. The acetone has worked okay too. But it's all evaporated. Well, that took off all of the paint that I'd covered just temporarily with. and softened a little bit the layer underneath. All right, let's check these two. So these are both the same one. Holy shit. Wow. So this one, it's taken off all of the prior person's paint job. It looks like there may even be one more coat of paint under there. I don't know if that's the original um, primer or the primer they used, or if it was, like I said, the original coat of paint and this was just like gray, brownie color. You do need to apply it fairly thick, or else it doesn't do anything. But, yeah, assuming you can handle the deadliness, it uh, will be good if I need to do any really fast, if I'm going to leave any overnight. We'll see how this one goes, because ideally 
That's what I would be using. So the easy strip is listed at uh, half an hour or one hour to overnight for a multi-layered paint, which this technically is. So we'll leave that for a bit. I'll do some other work and then we'll come back to it. So it's been about an hour and a half. Looks like I'm just going to have to use more. I mean, it's softer. But yeah, not super effective. So I'm going to reapply in the same spot. Significantly more this time. Then I'm going to go buy a paintbrush. All right, let's see how that works. All right, so this is after about two hours with more. I'm going to pull off this saran wrap and see how far down it got. So yeah, just those, that one layer, not one coat, but one layer of paint. And it's a lot more inconsistent than that one. Probably partly because of the time duration. The duration. Yeah. Not much progress there. So yeah, it definitely have to be an overnight thing. And even then, I'm a little leery that it's not going to pull all of it off. But, I have it, so it's worth trying. Uh, one thing it does mention is you need to neutralize it with water so it doesn't continue to dissolve everything. And we'll do that now. I don't know if that's enough water to neutralize it, but that's all I'm putting on. And we'll see if it eats through more paint. Which would not be a bad thing. Under these circumstances. But I guess if you were using this to find an old layer of paint, that it wouldn't be too bad. In conclusion, uh, I guess here are my thoughts. Acetone is more of more good to use as like a paint thinner cleaner sort of thing. It, it might be good to remove paint when it's still wet or hasn't fully cured as opposed to trying to lift paint off of a surface. Because of how quickly it evaporates, it's only really useful in sort of smaller applications, I would say, or if you could find a way to soak something in acetone uh, in a sealed environment. So like if you had a big tank of it, and then you just dropped whatever large thing it was you were trying to paint into the acetone. That might work. But, practically speaking, it's not really cost-effective for stripping the paint off your car. So I would use the acetone for things like cleaning your tools, like your paint gun, your goggles if you needed to, I guess, ideally while wearing something else. In in place of that. I'll let you look up acetone, but acetone is kind of, uh, it's something that your body even produces naturally. So you're not impervious to it, but in small quantities, it's less hazardous uh, than a lot of others, which is why these days uh, commercial painting operations use acetone as opposed to something else like xylene or some combination of acetone and something else. You, I think you'll find though that looking at 
the majority of your paint thinners, acetone is going to be one of the main components of it, uh, main polish remover, stuff like that. It is watered down in nail polish remover, so if you want a nail polish remover that works even better, acetone is just straight acetone. Um, but again, well ventilated areas, guys. Just whenever you're working with chemicals, please just read the MSDS sheets. Um, or SDS sheets, whatever they call them these days, uh, the safety data sheets that tell you what, how you should be handling it, and what to do in an emergency, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, how to store it. Uh, all of these things are important. Uh, with that disclaimer out of the way, let's move back to what I was talking about. So the Easy Strip. If if you were in an environment where you had to be more concerned about things like fumes and accidental contact and maybe if you don't for some reason can't perfectly clean up the area you're working with it's a better option in some regards but as far as being more environmentally friendly you have to use more of it than the toluene if you're going to be throwing it into a garbage bag at the end, as you should anyway, and disposing of it at whatever appropriate facility is in your area, you're just adding to the fact that now you have to cover it with plastic. Plastic has its own environmental impact on top of that. So it's just, it creates more waste and isn't super effective to begin with. So it's going to cost a lot. And overall, there are a few situations where I would actually recommend someone to use it. Toluene, as you can see, was obviously the more effective one. Uh, it's more considerate of your time. The biggest downside is just the, the sheer number of precautions you have to take with it because of how caustic it is. Really proper gloves, proper respirator, proper goggles, um, proper attire, even. As far as limiting any of them from damaging the, the object itself, the degree to which these things will have a negative effect on the item itself that you're trying to preserve will depend on the material it's made of. So in this context, we're only talking about metal. And I need to stress that because these things have, these chemicals have different effects on different materials. Like acetone might dissolve some forms of plastic or toluene would, or any of them but they're not necessarily all going to be the same. So bear that in mind. As far as metal goes, for acetone, because it evaporates immediately, it's, you know, there's a reason why, you know, one might try and start with that. But um, with toluene and the Easy Stripper, basically, right after it's taken the paint off, you want to make sure that, for example, you use the acetone to clean the surface so that it stops the chemical reaction and doesn't just eat away and corrode. I guess one more recommendation just sort of in the application process is that start with a specific area and try and remove all of the paint from that area. You'll probably find that there are a little bit, uh, some small areas where there will be some remnants of the paint and I would say try and remove those with other methods rather than wasting a whole bunch of toluene trying to pull that off. Or cost benefit or I guess the efficiency of the toluene was greatly reduced in that you had to put a huge amount on a small space to actually get those small spaces cleared rather than just sanding it or scraping it or doing something that's a little bit more damaging and immediate but overall kind of probably gets you to the same point if not makes you slightly better off especially in consideration of time. Yeah, one section at a time is what I'd suggest, and again, cleaning it up right after you're done so it's not sitting around for a long time in just bare metal, because that's the biggest problem. And I'll comment on this again in the $300 painting adventure episode where I do the actual stripping. You can watch that if you'd like. I'll link it at the end of this video or in the description. Maybe both. Maybe I'll do both. Before you decide on using a chemical to strip the paint on the vehicle, you should consider the sort of two other options as well and then figure out what's best. So first is going to be using heat. So heating up the paint 
uh, to strip it off. Advantage of that is, you know, you don't have to buy anything. If you already have a heat gun, that works. If you have a torch, you could maybe do that. The downside is it could set the vehicle on fire. It could burn something behind the thing that you're trying to pull the paint off. If it's a car, it will probably warp the metal. Well, depending on how thick the metal is, anyway. Uh, but the fumes as well are kind of uh, a big issue. Regardless, all of these options, you need to use the appropriate uh, PPE, and then it's kind of a moot point. All of them are going to be messy. Uh, with heat, like I said, there are those concerns. The next one is sort of physically removing it with a sander or some sort of other abrasion, abrasive. So if you're physically sanding it by hand, if you're using a palm sander or an orbital sander, I'd probably recommend an orbital sander because most palm sanders aren't really going to do a whole lot. If the paint is particularly strong, like in enamel or something like that, you may just have to go straight to using a flap wheel, which is more or less just a whole bunch of pieces of sandpaper um, laid on top of each other in a circle. I don't know if I can convey that. Anyway, Google what a flap wheel is. Downsides to that are the more abrasive of a paper you're using, the further it's going to go through, but then also the more of the actual surface you're going to take off just by physically damaging it in the course of sanding it. You might be able to get away with some specialty sandpapers that have certain hardness levels. I don't really know. I'm not an expert in sandpaper. But um, something to keep in mind. The biggest drawback is probably that the mess is not really containable. It creates a very fine dust, typically, and then it goes all over the place. If you're doing it inside, um, rather than a temporary structure, sort of, as I did it, you will end up with having dust kind of building up everywhere behind objects, like on your shelves and stuff like that. So you, if you don't make an effort to section off that area, it's going to go everywhere. And even if you do, it's probably still going to go everywhere to some extent. But because it's going to linger, then that sort of respiratory risk will stay around long after and uh, maybe there's a pile of it on your shelf and then you, you know, after you've done cleaned up painting years ago, suddenly you pull something off a shelf and you get a mouthful of, of paint dust. Uh, some of you might not be concerned about that. Any sort of particulate is always a risk to your respiratory system. We're not really designed to be inhaling stuff, that's why, and we're not going to get into that a whole lot. But a lot of the old paints were lead-based, so if nothing else, that should be a concern to you. In fact, it's probably affected me and I didn't even really notice. I don't know, that depends how dumb am I coming across right now, or how much less dumb would it have come across otherwise. Anyway, moving up. One more that I will add in terms of physically removing it is, you know, sand or glass bead blasting. That too can have issues. When you're using a glass bead blaster or sand blaster or anything like that, the air pressure projecting those little tiny pellets can create dimples in the sheet metal. Uh, so if you're working on a really heavy duty object, it's probably a fast and easy way of dealing with it. Still lots of stuff to clean up in that regard. If it's a smaller thing and you can keep it inside of like a glass bead blasting unit, uh, that's nice and easy to deal with, well, relatively speaking. But again, so the, there's pros and cons. It's honestly probably, unless you're sending it out, it's not a good option for someone at home to do. So then that leads us to the end one, which is kind of more traditionally messy, or at least in concept, and that's stripping paint with a chemical. It can be kind of a nuisance to deal with because then you have to have more personal protective equipment to deal with gloves, goggles, mask, or like a respirator, um, adequate airflow, again, sectioning stuff off to an even greater extent. It's going to be very pervasive. Basically, once it's started, it's going to hang around a little bit until you know, you've 
thoroughly cleaned everything, aired everything out. So if you're doing it in your garage, you probably need to even put up some wood structure and to prevent people from just going in casually. And you don't want your entire house to be filled with toluene fumes or xylene or, or even acetone, which dissipates probably faster than anything else. But you don't want chemical fumes everywhere, so you got to be careful with that. On the other hand, the benefits are it's typically faster and less physically involved than the other uh, options. If you were to say take your vehicle to get it like acid washed, that's an option. So as far as the chemicals go, yeah, uh, clean up after is important, but it's I guess to compare it to something like sanding is you're having to deal with, it's more like manure rather than flour or just dust all over a room that's been vacant for 30 years. So it's, it's more manageable in, in that it, it, it doesn't go everywhere. And again, that's with the exception of the actual fumes, but no matter what you're doing, you're going to need airflow uh, in order to actually have your PPE be effective. Anyway, you consider all the sort of pros and cons of each. Maybe look into them a little bit more thoroughly, depending on what catches your interest. Thank you guys for watching. That's all for today, and I'll see you guys next time.